Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. Here are some Linux, privacy and open source news for the first half of March 2020. And we have some interesting stuff, including the release of GNOME 3.36, an interesting game benchmarking tool and a surge in open source vulnerabilities. Let's take a look. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode provides Linux servers that make it super easy and affordable to host your own app, website or service right in the cloud. The interface is really easy to use and you can start your own server in just a few clicks. The best part is the one-click apps. Linode has a lot of services you can install on your server with just a click, like OpenVPN. Unlike third-party VPN services, using Linode and the one-click OpenVPN app allows you to keep total control of your data, privacy and security. For $5 a month, you can use Linode to host your own VPN and be certain that all your data is in your hands. Sign up for your free account today and get a $20 credit, which amounts to 4 months of free VPN, just by clicking the link in the description. March the 1st. Unity 8, the continuation of the Ubuntu Unity project, will get a name change. The desktop will now be called Lomiri. Developers cite many reasons, such as avoiding confusion with the Unity game engine and package names, since anything containing a specific distro's name in its package might get rejected from the Debian archives. They also state that they didn't suffer any pressure from Canonical or Ubuntu to change the name. They also used that name change to switch to GitLab instead of GitHub. We'll have to see how that project move along, since I haven't seen much from it since Ubuntu let it go. Ubuntu will ship the GNOME software store as a snap, starting from 20.04. While this change doesn't bother me, it seems that there is no Flatpak support in the software store in its snap incarnation, so by default users won't be able to access Flatpak. This seems like a major oversight. And while I have nothing against snaps, although I do feel flatback apps tend to start faster, I have no doubt some people will find it pretty anti-competitive from Ubuntu to ship something by default that prevents people from using a competing packaging solution. It will still be possible to install the regular dev packaged version of the store. Current Ubuntu users will also be transitioned to the snap instead of letting them keep the dev version, which means that they'll also have flatback support disabled by default, at least from the graphical user interface. That's not the smoothest way of doing things. DXVK 1.5.5 was released, improving DirectX 9 support for older Intel hardware and correcting bugs for a huge number of games, including Skyrim, Elite Dangerous, Just Cause, Saints Row the 3rd and 4th, Rocket League and Vampire the Masquerade. For a point release, it's a big one. March the 2nd. The freedesktop.org GitLab is in danger of losing its continuous integration servers. These CI machines run automated tests that allow developers to have more confidence that the code they push is of higher quality and doesn't break basic features. Since the hosting is getting very expensive, they are looking for a new patron to help them maintain these servers. If they can't find a new charitable donor, they'll probably have to cut CI back. This will impact X.org, but also Mesa, Wayland or LibreOffice, so it would obviously be bad. A study ranked various web browsers in terms of what telemetry data they send to their home companies. Brave ranks first, and Edge and the Yandex browser rank last. Edge collects the device UID, which is a unique identifier that could be used to track the user across other applications and aggregate data. It also sends data related to the web page the user visits, and these data collections cannot be disabled. Chrome, Firefox and Safari are also pretty nosy, but this telemetry can at least be disabled by the user in Firefox's case and reduced for Safari and Chrome. March the 5th. Zorin OS 15.2 was released. Although it doesn't bring any specific new features to Zorin OS, it now benefits from newer software versions and from the latest hardware enablement stack from Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. If you never tried Zorin OS and you're not opposed to GNOME, you should give it a go. It looks fantastic and brings a bunch of tweaks to make your experience easier. The Zorin Lite version is also one of the best looking XFCE implementations I've seen. March the 6th. DuckDuckGo announced Tracker Radar, a publicly available dataset about trackers on the web. It's open source and can be used to create block lists to stay free of tracking when you're browsing. The DuckDuckGo Privacy Essentials extension and browser make use of these datasets to ensure you have as private a browsing experience as possible. Other blockers exist, but they tend to use manually curated lists, which means they're a bit slower to update and can't be as comprehensive as something gathered automatically through crawling. These manual lists can also break some websites so the tracker radar should be a better solution and can be implemented by anyone who wants to make use of its datasets. March the 7th. The website It's Foss published an interesting interview of Gaël Duval, the founder of the Slash E Slash project. 
For those who haven't heard of it, it aims to provide an Android distribution completely de-googled. From the time servers to the DNS to the default applications, every bit that sends data to Google has been removed and replaced with something open source. Gael explains a lot in the article, and that project might be a real boon for those who want to move away from mainstream OSs without jumping immediately to a full Linux-based mobile OS with all the inconvenience it entails. March the 10th. Firefox 74 was released, with DNS over HTTPS enabled by default for American users. Users in other regions can enable it in the browser settings. This feature allows your browser to make encrypted DNS calls and avoid as much as possible your ISP spying on your browsing history. Firefox 74 can also import settings and history from the new Chromium Edge browser. To complete this release, Firefox also announced they would offer the beta version of the browser as a flat pack. This should make life easier for users who like to live on the bleeding edge. Firefox 75 will also ship as a flat pack on top of the regular packages. March the 11th. Proton 5.0-4 was released and it fixes quite a lot of bugs. It updates the XVK to version 1.5.5 and makes Origin work as well as Jedi Fallen Order. It also fixes issues with GTA 5, DRM problems in Just Cause 3 and Arkham Knights, and it improves frame launch times. As always, you'll get the update from Steam, just make sure to set it as default if you ever change that setting in Steam's preferences. March the 12th. GNOME 3.36 was released, with performance improvements and a lot of attention focused on the shell itself. It now handles the user's font settings, the notification panel has been revamped to be more legible as did the search results, and the application folders are now a lot easier to create and rename due to some improvements to the animations. Various applications gain some new features, including the ability to copy or move files to and from Google Drives, and Epiphany now handles dark mode on websites and can open PDFs in a tab. I have a dedicated video on this new release, check it out using the link in the upper right corner. March the 13th. Wine 5.4 was released, with more features for Direct2D and support for drawing text using DirectX 9, which should fix a bunch of games that didn't display text correctly. 30 bugs were also fixed, including for Divinity Original Sin 2, Final Fantasy V, Near Automata, or RPG Maker. The number of reported vulnerabilities in open source projects has surged 50% in 2019, with over 6,000 vulnerabilities disclosed. The good news is, these are very often reported with a patch to fix them, in 85% of cases, and this means that open source projects are still being watched for security and fixed rapidly. Still, it also means that open source teams have to spend more of their time on these issues than on improving the projects in other ways. And since open source developers don't always have enough time already, it could put a strain on the advancement of various fast projects. March the 14th. Mango HUD, the overlay designed to benchmark and oversee gaming performance on Linux, has a new release. While it was limited to recording performance on Vulkan games, it now can handle OpenGL as well. This means that the overlay should now be compatible with most games running on Linux. It also now displays input and output read and write speeds, the GPU clock speed, and has the ability to change the color of the HUD elements. And that's it for these news, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. If you really did like the video, I have a Patreon page, check it out using the link in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!